Good evening, everybody. It's great to see people joining us and uh, joining our room. We've got an exciting evening ahead for you. Um, I'm really excited to be your host tonight for the first session of the CMA Health Summit Series. I'm the CMA president, Dr. Catherine Smart, and I will be moderating this Twitter Spaces discussion. In a moment, we will hear from a panel of physicians and patient advocates about how to do health differently in Canada during COVID and beyond. We also want you to be part of the conversation. And since there's no chat function in Twitter spaces, we'd encourage listeners to tweet using the hashtag, hashtag CMA Health Summit. Since we're all participating in this virtual meeting from many parts of the country, I would like to acknowledge that we are all situated on many different treaty lands and traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories. As such, we pay our respects to the traditional caretakers of these lands and affirm our commitment to reconciliation our shared stewardship of the lands and our relationships with one another. Tonight, I think we have a very exciting and needed conversation ahead of us. The focus of tonight's discussion is seeing our collective will to rebuild healthcare. We all know that Canada's healthcare system is in a crisis, that primary care is imploding, surgical and diagnostic back are overwhelming, and it may take years and billions of dollars to resolve, and that in the meantime, patients and patient care is suffering as a result. At the same time, the pandemic has presented us with a once in a generation opportunity to build a more responsive, innovative, equitable and patient partnered health system. So how do we take advantage of it? Where do we start and how do we make it a reality? I think these are the big questions in front of us. They don't have simple answers, but I'm confident that the panel we have tonight is going to help us get closer to those answers. So I'd like to introduce our panelists to you. We have Dr. Tara Kieran. She is the Fidani Endowed Chair of Improvement and Innovation in Family Medicine and Vice Chair of Quality and Innovation in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Through her work as a team-based family doctor, Tara, Tara seeks to improve the healthcare system to better meet the needs of patients. And I know I have certainly enjoyed following her on Twitter and, and learning from her, so I'm excited to hear what she has to say. Sue Robbins is an amazing healthcare activist, speaker, and author which is amazing. I'm always amazed by people who can books. Her new book, Ducks in a Row, Healthcare Reimagined, explores the need to shift from a corporate model to a rehumanizing of the health system. So it's going to be fantastic to have her, her insights on all tonight. Dr. David Erbach is the head of the Department of Surgery and interim lead medical executive at Women's College Hospital in Toronto. David also focuses on developing new and better ways of providing surgical services that inform health policy decisions and address the issues of access to care, patient safety, and health system costs. So it's going to be great to have his, his insights since surgical backlogs are one of the incredibly pressing needs in our system. Dr. Nell Wyman is president of the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada and deputy chief medical health officer for the First Nations Health Authority in British Columbia. She's Canada's first female Indigenous psychiatrist and has more than 20 years of clinical experience working with Indigenous peoples in both rural, reserve and urban settings. And I've had the pleasure of getting to know Dr. Wyman in my work with CMA this year, and I'm very excited to hear her insights tonight. So I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to this space. Um, and I hope that you enjoy our conversation. So I'm going to lead off with a general question to each of our panelists. Tonight we're here and our topic is it's time differently about healthcare in Canada. And I'd like to ask each of you, what does differently mean to you? So perhaps I'll start with Nell. Why don't you tell us what does differently mean to you? Thanks, Catherine. And it really is a pleasure to be here uh, this evening. And hello to everyone who's listening in. You know, I think from my point of view, um, you know, I can't help but reflect kind of, you know, on what has happened during the pandemic, um, what has happened to people accessing the healthcare system and what has happened to the providers. So in order to be brief and have my other panelists have a chance to speak as well, I think I'll speak to, um, you know, the, the burnout amongst and exhaustion amongst physicians that, you know, was confirmed and discussed a lot over the last week or so uh, with the results of the National Physician Survey that, you know, we have all been asked to do more uh, with increasingly dwindling resources ourselves in terms of energy and capacity. And so I think we're really going to have to address that. Um, and for Indigenous physicians, for example, we're engaged in some uh, work right now developing a framework for physician wellness and joy in work. And I think just quickly, the other thing that has risen to the forefront, or at least we're having more discussions about it, is how 
COVID unmasked a lot of the inequities uh, in our healthcare system, particularly for people trying to access it. And access doesn't necessarily just mean having health services everywhere you turn, even if you live in a rural or remote place. Access also has to do with people being willing to seek services uh, when they are in distress. And we did see during COVID that Indigenous First Nations, Métis, Inuit people were very reluctant to seek care in some instances because of the fear that of how they would be treated. And there I'm speaking about racism and discrimination. So I've got lots more to say on that, but I think for now I'll stop and hand over to some of my other panelists. Thanks, Nell. That's a great note to get us started off on in terms of some of the things we really need to be thinking about. Tara, can I go to you next? Yeah, so thanks again for having me and uh, what an amazing panel. Um, I uh, want to build on Nell's comments um, because I would definitely say that differently would mean to me equitable. And uh, that includes really acting on the social determinants of health and having a healthcare system that acts upstream to prevent downstream problems. Um, we've, we saw during the pandemic that issues like homelessness or precarious housing, precarious employment, uh, income, race, all of those impacted how well someone was, how likely they were to get COVID, how likely they were to get really sick. Um, and although we can address some of those through our healthcare organizations doing a better job at uh, understanding bias and addressing bias, Ultimately, I think some of those solutions really do need to be upstream in um, being able to tackle the social determinants of health and even the structural determinants that determine the social determinants. And by that, I mean racism, capitalism, uh, sexism, uh, et cetera. I also think a, a, a different, to me, different, it would mean integrated, a health system that's integrated and community-based. Um, we saw, you know, in, in COVID-19 that uh, there the hospitals were actually pretty well positioned to deal with the crisis that came their way. Um, they have IPAC professionals um, working there uh, who deal with infection prevention and control uh, as their job. Um, they had the resources to de redeploy staff as needed. Um, where I think the strain was greater and where there, there was uh, less capacity to respond um, quickly and effectively were in the community-based sectors. And those are sectors that have been, relatively speaking, underfunded, but are also not integrated with um, uh, uh, the, the hospital sector. So, you know, can we imagine a future forward where the IPAC professional, the infectious disease professional at the hospital actually supports um, the, the primary care centers, the home care centers, the long-term care centers in being able to enhance their own um, uh, infection prevention control and that we're working together in a network way and that we're community-based because I think another really uh, tremendous uh, a tremendous innovation in the pandemic, or I shouldn't say innovation because I think we've, we've known this for some time, but something we did right was, you know, in, in many areas was partnering with communities to get vaccinations to where they were needed. Um, that took some time, but ultimately when it when that was done in um, cities like Toronto, where I live, um, but also in uh, First Nations communities, so there was a tremendous success up um, in the First Nation communities up in northern Ontario because they took a community-driven, community-based approach in being able to uh, deliver those healthcare services. So to me, a better healthcare system is equitable, integrated, community-based, and I'd also add patient-centered and creative. Um, but we can get to those in, in, in a, uh, later on in the conversation. Awesome. Thanks for, for those thoughts. And uh, I love what both of you have said so far. Um, and I particularly love your comments about the importance of looking upstream, because certainly as a pediatrician, that, that really resonates with me, the need to really be supporting uh, Canadians differently than we often do. Sue, over to you. I'd love to hear your perspective as a patient advocate. What does different look like to you? Oh, thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, so I'll be giving a patient and caregiver perspective. And doing healthcare differently to me, I think, means looking at the reasons why we do healthcare to begin with. And I believe that healthcare at its core is about caring for each other as human beings. And it's about relationships between the caregiver and the care receiver. And I'm just going to throw this in there, dare I say, I think it's also about love. And we've drifted very far away from what I consider our why. Um, from my patient perspective, we've had a lot of incremental change, but to me, it feels like you're putting a Band-Aid on in the ICU and it's really not working. Um, there's too much emphasis on what we do, programs and services, and not enough on the why we are here to begin with. And like I said, I believe that's about caring for each other. Um, 
And right now, I feel as a patient that healthcare is really built around the altar of efficiency. Um, you know, I had 12 minutes for my cancer radiation appointment. That's what the radiation tech told me. That's it, 12 minutes, nothing more um, to get my breast cancer radiation. I had three minutes with my OB when I, when I was pregnant with my last child. You know, we had a cardio cardiologist that started dictating her notes when we were still in the room with our little baby with Down syndrome when my son was born 19 years ago. You know, I've had specialists who've had their hand on the door the entire time they were talking to me because I knew that they were rushed. And I believe that efficiency causes harm to both the patients and physicians and other clinicians. And that's because patients are not cars to be churned through a car factory and that physicians are not, car, are not factory workers. And I'll, I'll just close with saying, you know, I, I've had the good fortune to speak at Grand Rounds um, before the pandemic even all over the world. I was actually in Tasmania <laughs> and in Toronto, and the same thing happened to me at these grand rounds in um, 2019, was that I was talking about kindness and healthcare and things like knocking on the door and introducing yourself and describing what you're going to do before you come in and all these small touches, which are actually a really big deal to patients. But every time I, talk at I speak at grand rounds, I can see there's somebody agitated in the back and they're just waiting to ask me a question. And so at the very end of my talk, we open up for questions and somebody stands up and says, well, we don't have time for all these kindnesses. That's what I get told. And if that's the case, and I've heard it over and over and over again, I really feel as if we've lost the plot here with healthcare in Canada. Thanks for sharing that, Sue. And I couldn't agree more. And what really struck me as you were talking was, I think, the root cause of so much burnout for the providers in the system too is that loss of the connection with patients which is why all of us chose this work to begin with so I think thank you for reminding us that this is about people it's about this it's about connection and it's not only patients that need that it's also the providers so I appreciate that perspective. David what are your thoughts when we talk about doing healthcare differently in Canada what does that mean to you? Um, it, it means a few things and I think what it really means right now is uh, using the, uh, this opportunity to address some systemic structural problems in the health system uh, that have really, really been problematic uh, in Canada for many years uh, with respect to you know, provision of uh, surgical procedures, addressing things like access and wait times, uh, and having a system that's really equitable uh, for the population uh, and accessible to everybody and provides uh, uh, equal opportunities also to the to the healthcare workforce. Uh, there's a lot of discussion now about the surgical backlog, about the crisis with people waiting for surgery. Uh, the federal gov government has made a recent announcement of increases to the Canada Health Transfer to try and address this. Um, and I, I think it's important to remember when we're talking about a backlog, it's really just an extreme case of a uh, of an endemic and systemic problem that we've been grappling with uh, for many years now. Uh, I think. What's been unmasked to us is uh, the nature of some of these problems and uh, how much inequity there is built into the system right now as it exists. Uh, we do know that there are some tools available to us that uh, can be really helpful in rebuilding a system uh, that's more sustainable, that's more responsive uh, to the needs of the population um, and uh, is more uh, e equitable for the population as well as for um, uh, for the healthcare workforce. So. Uh, to me, it means not squandering an opportunity to make uh, much needed reforms uh, that will really uh, give us a better and more resilient system uh, as we move forward. Thank you, David. And I think that's so true. We're sort of uh, at this juncture in time where we need to really capitalize on this moment and make sure that we can move forward with a system that's actually going to be there and able to see Canadians. So we've heard lots of great opening thoughts from our panelists. Um, and I'm now going to move into the next question to sort of explore those issues a bit deeper. I'd love to hear from each of you. You know, you've described sort of what you see your vision of the future, some of the fundamental ideas and values that underlie it. What do you see are the building blocks to create a more responsive, innovative, and patient-centered and patient-partnered health system? I'm going to start with you this time, Sue. Sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the building blocks. Okay. <clears throat> so... I just want to build on a bit what David said about system change. And, you know, I really believe there's two levels of change. There's system change and there's also what we can do as individuals um, to make things better in our everyday lives. And in fact, Docs and Row is about that, about what we can do, what is in within our, within our power, within our serenity prayer, but what's in our control and what's not as far as changing healthcare. So 
I have some very practical suggestions about what I believe from my perspective. I worked in patient engagement for many years, um, as well as being a breast cancer patient and also the mom of a, of a child with Down syndrome, as I said. And my very practical suggestions are these. There's three of them. Um, the first one is thinking of healthcare environments as healing spaces, um, not spaces that cause trauma to people. And, um, you know, you'd mentioned about creativity. I think leaning on the arts and the humanities is a really great way to, say, to start that. You know, I think about things like very practical, again, uh, soft music in the waiting rooms, turn off CNN and the TV, you know, leaning on the visual arts and having spaces for storytelling. Um, in fact, the last children's hospital I worked in, we started a book club and we met with families together with staff to discuss the book um, that we were reading um, about healthcare. So really thinking about healthcare as being healing, I think that would be a reframing as opposed to traumatic, which I believe that it is or it has been for me uh, right now. Um, the second thing is, is to create safe spaces for feedback. And this to me, I get really stuck on this as a thorn in my side. I, I don't think that those folks higher up in administration are open to um, honest feedback from either patients or people, clinicians, people who work for patients. And I think if we opened ourselves up to the experience of healthcare and what it's like to work in healthcare and also to be cared for in healthcare, and that includes the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, then I think that's where change would actually happen. And that hasn't happened so far. Like I, you know, anytime I've had some constructive feedback, I get shut down as being, you know, minimized or I get called hysterical or, you know, people just really want me to go away. But one point I really want to make is that patients have lots of really great ideas, especially for those of us who are invested in the healthcare system. And what's interesting about creating safe spaces for feedback and for people to share their stories, there's an organization called Care Opinion in the UK, and they're also in Australia. And um, what that is, is an online system where people can share stories about their experiences in healthcare. And they've told me that 60 to 70% of those stories that are shared are actually good, positive stories, which I think... I wish there was a mechanism for us patients to be able to say thank you, especially now during COVID to the healthcare professionals that look after us. And then the 40 to, 30 to 40% of stories that might be more negative or what I like to say is constructive feedback, I think that that's how we get quality improvement is when things go wrong. So, you know, that's my second point. And my third point is, you know, I hope we get to talk about patient engagement because we talked about patient-centered care, I know uh, is in the title, but Really, engagement is about outreach, and it means going out to the people and doing things together, I think, and beyond the boardroom. And um, uh, like Tara had mentioned, going out to communities to finding out what's important to them is something that I think would really rechange, uh, reframe healthcare as, as we see it today. And enough of the ivory tower stuff about people making decisions for us so far removed with what real life is like, both at point of care in the hospital and out in communities. Love all those ideas, Sue. Thank you so much. And I, I think your point is well taken that we have to, when we say we want feedback, we have to mean it and we have to be open to what people have to say. And we have to think of real authentic ways to partner with patients and hear their voices, not just pay lip service to it. Tara, you have lots of ideas, I know. Tell us, what do you see as the building blocks? Thanks, uh, Catherine. I mean, I, I think I'd like to focus on two building blocks. And, and the first is really building off what Sue said. And that building block is patient partnership. And patient partnership, not just in a clinical encounter, but patient partnership to help us redesign the system. Because I, I totally agree with what Sue said. And I, I will say that working with patients has really helped me transform how I look at things and has revealed to me um, my own blind spots uh, and often has led to uh, new and creative ideas that I would never have come up with on my own. Um, sometimes there are actually obvious ideas that I'm like, why didn't I come up with that on my own? But in any case, there are ideas that we hadn't come up with and we weren't planning on executing, but that sometimes are simple, sometimes are complex and make make a difference. And and so I'm speaking here from, you know, when we started back in 2014 to doing a patient experience survey at our family health team to then lots of experiences I've had working with patients around focus groups or patient engagement days or even doing a province-wide consultation uh, uh, around with patients. And uh, I've learned so much from that. And I honestly feel that if there's one thing if I would go back and do differently around this pandemic that I felt I would have control over, it would be to really fight to actually have built a citizens council during COVID um, where we could actually uh, ask ordinary people who live in Ontario or Canada 
what they thought at various stages and how they would value the trade-offs. Because I don't think ordinary people really had that opportunity to engage in dialogue with decision makers to help inform those policies. Um, so that's just so that I think is a very key building block. And, and thank you, Sue, for articulating it so clearly. The second building block is going to be no surprise coming from me, and that is, of course, I think a strong primary care system. So we know that health systems that have strong primary care systems have better outcomes, um, they have more equitable outcomes, and they actually also have lower costs. Um, and, and so, you know, my dream is that every patient in Canada, every person living in Canada should have a family doctor or other primary care provider. And I don't think this is just a pipe dream. I don't think this is something that is unattainable. I really think we could make it happen if we if we focus on it. And also if we compromise, um, because I think there are trade-offs that, that we might need to make to make it a reality. I do think it would take some investment. So I think we, we need to make family medicine, continue for it to be attractive to family doctors um, and, and, uh, and other primary care professionals. And, and that means, for example, uh, changing the way we pay doctors so it's not fee-for-service, so we're not tied to time in the way that Sue described, um, to expanding team-based care. S uh, studies have shown that team-based care um, produces better outcomes. Uh, we've just published a study that showed that, you know, teams, um, patients that were take, uh, got care from a team, um, they seem to have uh, lower emergency department use than, than those that weren't. Um, so we know that that and we also know that those things, changing the way we're paid as doctors and um, introducing teams is something that new doctors really want in order to be able to enter the profession. And it's something that doctors who are currently in the profession want to uh, alleviate and address some of that burnout that we've been talking about as well. Um, I do think that ideally, though, you know, those investments come with some trade-offs, perhaps with physicians from an accountability perspective. So we need to be more accountable, I think, to our communities and um, the geographic neighborhoods in which our practices are based and start to make more of a commitment that we're going to take on unattached patients, for example. And, you know, to start, we probably have to be really mindful of taking an equitable approach so that we're not just um, taking any unattached patients or the first cut comes through the door, but perhaps there is, you know, while we still don't have the capacity we would desire when the capacity is more limited, let's start by taking those who are most at need. Um, you know, let's prioritize attachment for, for example, indigenous populations and black populations, populations, people who uh, are struggling with uh, opioid addiction, p people who we know um, have, have a high need for health care potentially or are at greater risk for health, uh, worse health outcomes. So how can we prioritize those people to have access to a family doctor? I think we can do it and there are creative ways in which some of my colleagues have already started to do that. So that, those are the two things that I would focus on to start patient partnership in redesigning our health care system and a strong primary care. Love it. T totally agree. So important and certainly something that we have been trying to um, talk about a lot as well is that need to really reimagine that primary care system in this country so that Canadians have access to the front door of the healthcare system. It's so critical and, and concerning where we're headed. And I think we're going to hear more from you on that topic shortly. Um, but David, I'd like to go back to you now. What do you see are, are the building blocks that you'd like to see? Um, so I think I'd like to uh, build a little bit on what Tara was just uh, describing uh, with respect to working in teams and a broader integration across the system, because I think that really applies to the way that we deliver surgical services as well. Um, one of the problems right now is the uh, the lack of coordination and the, the siloed and highly independent nature of uh, how a lot of uh, surgeons work in Canadian hospitals and how uh, surgery is organized. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for greater participation within the health system of uh, surgical care providers uh, so that, uh, you know, for example, we could be more coordinated uh, into teams, uh, you know, sharing the care of patients. Um, we could uh, have single entry models where uh, pay there's a central intake or a, a single queue for patients who enter a system so that wait times for surgery are uh, more equitable uh, without as much variation as we see from region to region and hospital to hospital. Uh, overall, these have a lot of benefits to the population and, and improve satisfaction with care as well as uh, confidence in the health system. Uh, so I, I see that as a, a huge opportunity for uh, system innovation uh, when it comes to how we organize uh, surgical care. Um, the other area that people often talk about is greater investment in the system, uh, you know, greater funding, our ability to increase the supply. Uh, it, it's important to realize right now, although 
Uh, obviously, we need to uh, provide as much surgical care as possible to address uh, the issue of, of backlog. Um, we do have some limits, uh, primarily right now, uh, we're really stressed with respect to health human resources, uh, skilled nurses in hospitals, uh, anesthetists, surgeons. Well, we really don't have that much capacity to really uh, increase the amount of services we provide um, at, at point. And I think uh, right now we really have to focus on what we can do to better coordinate and streamline the movement of patients across the system uh, to be able to enhance access with the resources that we have. Thanks, David. I'm hearing some definite themes emerge, I think, from everyone. A lot working as teams, uh, being more efficient with what we have, looking for those potentially easy wins just by reorganizing how we do things and, and that importance of, of patient ideas and, and, and centering some of this on, on what they see, because uh, sometimes the solutions might be more obvious than them than they are to us. Nala, I'd love to hear your perspective. What do you think are some of the critical building blocks that we need to be thinking about as we reimagine the health system? Yes, thanks, Catherine. I think uh, my comments actually, I think, are very much aligned with what people have already mentioned. Here in British Columbia, which is where I'm situated, and I do work for the First Nations Health Authority, you know, even prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of effort that went into uh, using cultural, the, the ideas and actions associated with cultural safety and cultural humility, hardwiring those into the health system, and this leads to health uh, transformation. And and people have mentioned, you know, the, the concepts related to cultural safety already, but, you know, it is an outcome that's based on respectful engagement that recognizes and strives to address power imbalances inherent in the health system. So we hear that, you know, when people have mentioned patient-centered care, for example, and cultural humility of the providers is, you know, that we all undergo a process of self-reflection to understand personal and systemic biases and to develop and maintain respect respectful processes and relationships based on mutual trust. So those concepts, I think, um, as uh, lay a foundation for, first of all, providing uh, better care, increasing access, uh, but in, in, in the benefit to everyone is it's, it, it's a better system overall, and it, it manages to reach out to some of those communities and populations that have been underserved uh, to date, the, some of the communities that Tara mentioned. So I'm using this in the, in, the, in the context because of the work I do with First Nations, but it's really applicable to all. And, you know, here in British Columbia, for example, we are working on the finishing touches to developing a provincial standard. Uh, a partnership between uh, the organization I work for and health standards organization that lays out um, the different domains that are required to increase cultural safety uh, as part of different health organizations and health systems. And there, you know, people I'm sure have heard of the different reports that have come out of BC during the pandemic as well, including the In Plain Sight report, which found that racism is widespread in the health system here in BC. So the other thing that I would mention when we're talking about team-based care and um, expanding different models of care, I would, I would say from you know a First Nations lens, from an Indigenous lens, being able to work in what we call a two-eyed, using a two-eyed seeing approach. So recognizing the value of Western medical systems and ways of being, recognizing the importance and value of Indigenous knowledge and ways of being. And, and that's not to say that every Indigenous patient is going to want to seek um, traditional healing or ceremony as part of their health care. But up until now, it has been really difficult for Indigenous patients to access that in many instances. And that, I think, you know, being able to provide work in those two systems in different settings, and I know this is happening in other places across the country, not just in British Columbia, CAMH, for example, in downtown Toronto, that provides better patient care in this instance to Indigenous patients. But for other uh, intersectionalities, other groups. There are similar uh, models that could be that could be used. So I think cultural safety in the system, cultural humility of healthcare providers prov provides a really good background or um, foundation uh, for moving, transforming healthcare in Canada. Thank you, Nell, for highlighting that. It's so important. And again, I think something that we we just keep learning more about it and how critical it is to create a safe space for patients and as you touched on in the opening uh actually having them want to access the healthcare system and having it be a place where they they feel safe is, is so important 
we've been talking, I think, quite a bit about primary care. And I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into that issue, because it, it's such a critical problem right now. You know, as, as people have outlined tonight, we know that primary care forms the, the foundation or the backbone of our healthcare system. It's the front door into the healthcare system. We know, as, as um, Tara said, a high functioning primary care system um, is better for patients, improves people's lives, makes people's lives longer, higher quality and cuts the healthcare system. Yet we also know we're facing this huge crisis in primary care for, I think, a huge variety of reasons. Um, but the, the reality of that is that, all, you know, over 5 million Canadians don't have access to a family doctor. Um, and we're expecting that to get worse, not better, if something doesn't change. Also, our recent National Health Survey showed that almost half of doctors are planning on cutting back their clinical hours in the next two years. So it's, it's concerning. Um, you know, Tara, I know that your research really focuses on quality improvement and innovation in family medicine. Um, and you, you've already alluded to some ideas you have around the fact that we should have that goal of getting every Canadian a family doctor and you think it's achievable. So tell us more about that. What should we be doing to innovate in this space? How do we get uh, doctors practicing longitudinal family medicine? What can we do uh, to get things back on track? Yeah, such important questions. Um, and, you know, I want to start just by um, building on what you said, Catherine, about that the problem is just going to get worse right now. So I think, fortunately, um, some of the research that we've done ourselves here in Ontario has shown that the proportion of family doctors who stopped working was much higher um, in the first six months of the pandemic than it was for the 10 years prior to that. So that, that data to me suggests that, you know, many doctors went into early retirement um, at the same time, we've done surveys of family doctors in Toronto and found that nearly one in five physicians, family doctors in Toronto who have an active practice, are thinking that they may close their practice in the next five years. So, yeah, really concerning that um, we already have a workforce shortage and things um, may be getting tighter. So I do think that we need to, to place um, pieces to stabilize our workforce and uh, make family medicine attractive to the people who are in it now and to new graduates. And, and then I was saying, as I was saying earlier, I think that that involves payment reform. Um, and it's great to see that advancing, for example, here in Ontario um, and as well in British Columbia, there's some pilots that uh, seem like they need to be expanded. Um, there are other pilots elsewhere as well, but we really need to move away from fee for service more towards um, blended payments, blended payments that um, uh, encourage uh, also care of people with complex, uh, who have medical complexity because um, that's been a weakness in Ontario for some time. Uh, and then, you know, uh, working in teams. So I work with a pharmacist, a social worker, dietitian, uh, nurses. Um, these are all part of the, the my amazing team uh, in my practice, which is a family health team, and I feel lucky to do so every day. And so that's that really transforms how I can deliver care. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm many, many years from medical school, but I can still keep current some of the latest new medications, including new medications to treat COVID, because I have a pharmacist who is in the office beside me who I can consult and who can give me advice around starting these kinds of new medications. Um, when a patient is struggling with depression, I have a social worker who I can turn to, to ask, you know, what are some, you know, resources that might support them? Or can you see them for a short, you know, short uh, time, uh, for a limited amount of time to kind of get them stabilized? Um, so, so, it, and, and then, you know, the nurses are, are absolutely uh, indispensable. So uh, for, for example, when we were managing a lot of people with COVID as outpatients, our nurses ran a whole COVID care at home program uh, where they would check in with, with, uh, with folks. And I know many of my colleagues practice, practice in settings that don't have those resources and that's not fair to them. And it's certainly not fair to their patients. Um, we need to expand this kind of team-based model, which works, which provides joy and work and better patient outcomes across the country. I also think that there's ways in which we can really um, lean into uh, creativity and collaboration and learning from what's worked right in different settings. And so I'm most familiar with the innovations occurring in Ontario, but I, I want to just draw attention to a couple of colleagues who've been doing amazing work. So Jonathan Fitzsimmons in Renfrew County, for example, has been doing incredible work collaborating with uh, paramedics to deliver primary care in an underserviced rural area and then trialing a virtual family health team as a way to uh, uh, deliver care um, to unattached patients a as well. So using creative solutions um, to try and meet uh, a very challenging um, problem. Um, and another person whose work I'd like to highlight is TFM, Dr. TFM, a close colleague of mine at Southeast Toronto Family Health Team. Um, she's worked with colleagues in the East End to join, to put together a family practice network 
Um, and these, um, this family practice network was really instrumental in COVID and being able to deliver vaccinations and, and long-term care in their area. Um, they were one of the first to be able to, to actually complete all the vaccinations and long-term care in their neighborhood, um, to, to take care of um, patients in retirement homes, um, to step up during um, uh, for when it came to testing in um, some of the priority neighborhoods in Toronto as well. Uh, so that network of doctors was stronger than any of the single doctor practices on their own. And how can we learn from these kinds of innovations? I think we can. I think we can start to move towards more network models where we support each other to care for our communities. And, and that's the kind of innovation I'd like to see coming out of the pandemic. Thanks for highlighting uh, those examples. And again, I think we're just noticing a lot of themes that we're hearing from each other. You know, this idea of team, working with other like-minded people, feeling supported to care for patients, sharing sharing that that work um, to make sure that patients are getting what they, they've needed and, and finding that joy again in this work, which I think takes us back to what Sue said at, at the beginning, which is that medicine should be about connection and kindness and um, finding finding that with each other. Uh, Catherine, can I just jump in yes, just, please, just really please. quick? Um, just thinking about primary care. Um, you know, when we're talking about team, I always have this hope. I was thinking about the reimagined healthcare world, but that we're not only talking about professionals, that we think about patients being on that team too. I think that that's really, really important. And I was just thinking when Nell was speaking, you know, and she was talking about choice and giving people choice as far as what type of medicine they want to access. <clears throat> and a lot of people ask me about patients. They say, though I don't represent patients, I only represent myself, but they say, what do patients want? And my answer is always, it depends. <laughs> and um, how do you find out what patients want? And, and the answer to that is ask them. So when Tara, Tara is talking about all the different team models, and I came from Alberta, which had, I don't know if it still does, but it did have at the time a very strong primary care network model. And I think having that choice um, when you enter primary care to go to a social worker or an NP or a pharmacist, I think that's something that patients would embrace as well and also have you know, choices of urgent care centers and, and places are open a bit later. So we don't always end up in emergency. And, and, you know, the choice, I think, works both for you as the professionals and for us patients, because we're not alike. None of us are alike. So there is no one answer for everybody. Yeah, so true. Totally agree with that. And I think that's a great perspective. And you're absolutely right. I think we need, when we think about what we mean by team, we need to be thinking about patients and, and their place on the teams with us collaborating 100%. Um, so, uh, Tara, I know you work in Toronto and you were talking about colleagues in Ontario. I live in, in the north, in the Yukon, um, and we know that there's, you know, other challenges for sure reaching remote and rural communities. Um, and I know that one of the really exciting things I think we've seen out of British Columbia and the First Nations Health Authority is their work uh, with some more remote and rural First Nations communities. And we saw, again, a ton of innovation and, and important models of care that were created there to make sure that patients, um, First Nations patients in BC were able to access care. So Nell, I was hoping you could tell us a bit about your experience working at the First Nations Health Authority during the pandemic and what the rest of the country can learn from your health authority and the way it was able to guard and champion the health and wellness of Indigenous people in British Columbia. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. I think, you know, one of the one of the things that happened at the very beginning of the pandemic was we realized that people would need to, you know, would need to be in touch with health services and, and access them, even while uh, many communities are uh, located in rural, remote and very isolated settings. In some cases, some communities are only fly in. And so very quickly, uh, a virtual service was uh, set up, which was the virtual doctor of the day program. And for the first time, some people had access to primary care that they didn't before. And of course, the, the service was grounded in cultural safety and cultural humility. And uh, we found that people, you know, who had an access for the variety of reasons that I've talked about and others have talked about earlier uh, was, you know, there was really good uptake. And then almost quickly after that, we realized the other thing to remember is that British Columbia has actually been living through two public health emergencies. One is 
the COVID pandemic and one is the toxic drug poisoning crisis. And in many ways, uh, First Nations communities have been disproportionately impacted by both. So there was another virtual service that was set up, the virtual um, psychiatry and substance use service where people could see uh, either psychiatrists and or a addiction medicine specialist. And the two of those two virtual services worked together in a complementary fashion. So if you were unattached, for example, to a primary care provider, and wanted to be seen during the psychiatry service, as an example, you could quickly be seen by the doctor of the day and then referred on to see the specialist. So that was something that will that was stood up. Uh, it quickly reached capacity, uh, but it, and we're looking to expand. And uh, it will be one of our legacy pieces as the, you know, as the pandemic sort of hopefully at some point starts to wind down. Um, and then I guess the other thing, you know, that was mentioned uh, I think it was Tara mentioned, it was just creativity, you know, being able, even in the midst of being very stressed and, and everybody working very long hours, like the vaccination rollout, for example, was, ex you know, extremely successful here in British Columbia because people used creativity as a way uh, to deliver vaccines. And, and one creative one creative way was we took a whole of community approach, whereas the rest of the province was allocating the nation by age group. We strongly advocated uh, for a whole of community. So communities were um, 18 and older to start with were vaccinated. So those are just some quick examples. But I think what I really want to stress, I think for us as physicians is that need to um, you know, even though we're kind of overworked and we're feeling we're feeling stressed out, we're feeling overwhelmed, that there's always been that space, that motivation, that drive to continue to advocate uh, for our patients and and be creative in doing so and looking for the solutions. And that will differ, of course, across the different provinces and territories from coast to coast to coast. Thank you, Nell, for those examples. And again, I, I just think it's amazing to see how people were able to pivot in a crisis to leverage different tools to actually improve access to care, uh, which is amazing, right? Because we were worried about that. How are we going to reach people? And you've actually been able to find a model that improves care beyond what the communities had experienced before. And then how do we keep moving that forward? So it's, it's amazing to see, like you said, just that creativity um, and that importance of, of seeing communities and their unique needs and, and listening to what they want, um, which Sue's been telling us about. I'm going to pivot a bit away from primary care now and, and back to something we talked about a bit at the beginning. Uh, we know in addition to the crisis in primary care, probably one of the other biggest pain points in the current system is the backlog issue. Um, we did a report at CMA last fall and estimated that we were going to need a minimum of $1.3 billion in funding to clear that backlog across only eight medical procedures. So we knew that was really the tip of the iceberg. And that was before the fourth and fifth waves of COVID that have increased backlogs even more. And, and we know that it, the main backlogs are in doc imaging and surgery. Um, and we know that these delays have had an incredible uh, impact on people's quality of life. And there's a lot of suffering. Um, you know, David, you're a surgeon. You're the head of a department of surgery at a large hospital. And you've talked a little bit ab about, you have some ideas about what we could be doing about, love to hear more from you about what are some innovative approaches to improve capacity and reduce this growing backlog in these really critical, uh, important surgical procedures. So I think some of the uh, technological innovations that we've seen over the last few years have been really helpful in addressing some of these problems. Um, you know, in particular, uh, use of, uh, you know, for example, uh, outpatient surgery for common surgical procedures uh, you know, you know, total joint replacement, which uh, historically had always been an inpatient procedure with a, a few days in hospital, uh, has been transformed into essentially an outpatient procedure for hip and knee replacement. Uh, a lot of surgical procedures can now be done on an outpatient basis, which really helps improve efficiency, decreases dependence on hospital beds, which have obviously become very, very scarce. Uh, so these types of uh, technological innovations have been really helpful uh, and uh, I think it's a trend I'd like to see continued, which is uh, innovations that, um, you know, in the past, it seemed like a lot of innovation just really increased cost and complexity. But now we're seeing innovations for sustainability and for uh, uh, yeah, efficiency within the health system that I think is going to be really important. So uh, those types of innovations are really helpful for improving our capacity uh, to do surgical procedures. Um, there's probably also some work we can do on the demand side. Uh, we do know that uh, in addition to uh, this huge uh, backlog of patients who are currently waiting for diagnostic imaging, testing, and uh, procedures, surgery, 
um, you know, a lot of those are for urgent and critical procedures, but we do know that uh, a lot of people are waiting for uh, tests or procedures that they may not uh, necessarily need. Um, if we can do a better job at Im improving our appropriateness to make sure that the patients on the wait list are really those patients who truly need the, uh, the tests or the procedures that they're waiting for, will uh, obviously um, reduce the wait times for uh, everybody uh, within the health system. Yeah, it's such an important point, I think, about that accountability and how we're using resources and making sure that they're being used um, effectively um, so that there is more access to people. And, and I think that's you know, one of the things we've been talking about is the need to have more of a data driven healthcare system. And I think what you're talking about would, you know, is just one more example of how data could improve the way we utilize our resources if we're able to track and monitor the appropriateness of diagnostic imaging, testings, referrals, surgeries that patients have uh, to make sure that we're optimizing those outcomes of them. So I'd love to hear from your perspective, like as a patient, what do you think we could be doing to reduce wait times when you're hearing this conversation? You know, what springs to mind for you? Well, I'm currently waiting for a mammogram and I've been waiting for six months and I still haven't received my appointment from the cancer agency. And I did have breast cancer before, so it's a little bit distressing um, in the waiting. And I, I wanted to talk about not the data, because I'm not a data person, but the stories behind that and I used to work at a children's hospital that had an autism clinic and there was a very long wait list for the families to come in with their kids to get diagnosed, to have the assessment to get diagnosed with autism. And I would talk to many, many of those families in that waiting and how distressing it is to wait. And in fact, the time between I went to my family doctor, you know, with a lump in my breast to when I finally got my breast biopsy was three months. And I have to say that that waiting was purgatory. It was awful. It was like the worst thing Thing, you know, once you're finally off that wait list and they're doing something, I think mentally that's a lot better for patients. So I've always wondered about wait lists. If anyone has ever talked about the experience of either being on a wait list or waiting to get on a wait list, which is there's this pre wait list thing that happens too, right? While we're waiting for a referral to a specialist and how we are caring for people while they're waiting. I think, you know, in the absence, like David said, you know, there's certain capacity for ORs and surgeons and and if we've reached that, particularly with the staffing crisis, is there a way for us to be caring for people while they wait so that they don't experience so much trauma in the waiting? And I think, you know, people like peer support workers and social workers could really, um, you know, nursing navigators, those types of people could probably step in and make your job as physicians a bit easier because we're not quite as distraught by the time we get to you, right, within the waiting. So you know, as we talk about these kind of hard things, these database things, I, I, I just hope that we can always think about the experience and the story and what goes along with that and talk about those things together. Well, I think those are great points. And, and I think, you know, the other thing it touches on, I think, is how much we've normalized waiting in our healthcare system, right? We've We've taken waiting for all these things, as you as you outlined, and, and kind of made it an expected part of the experience rather than asking those questions about could this look different. Um, and I absolutely agree with you. And I see that certainly with my patients, just the stress and the anxiety uh, that people experience when they're waiting, particularly, as you said, if they're maybe not experiencing care in that period uh, can be really impactful. Yeah, even even the term backlog, like that return that reminds me of like a sewage backup. Like I hope that we can remember that there's people behind the numbers. Like that's one of the things I've despaired about so much with the pandemic is that I feel like our public health officials have totally dehumanized, you know, people who've gotten sick and died from COVID. And what's really important to me is we start you know, remembering there are people behind the numbers who have families and, um, you know, always talking about both, right? The numbers are important, but also the story piece is important too. Yeah, oh, I absolutely agree with you. And I think there is nothing more powerful uh, than, than stories. And, and I think they're very compelling and they're an important part of, like you said, moving us past just, just the numbers to really understanding the human, the very real and human impact of these issues. So we've got about six minutes left in this discussion um, and it was just announced today uh, that the federal budget is going to be uh, tabled on April 7th. So we, we've heard today about lots of potential uh, areas that we want to see focus on that we think need to change. So I'd like to just ask each of you to, to close out with what you're hoping to see in the budget um, and what needs to be in there from your perspective to address the future of healthcare. So uh, why don't we start with uh, Tara? Catherine, there's always so much that I think we all want to see in the budget. I mean, maybe I'll just start by saying that I, I am hopeful for um, that we will make progress on national dental care and pharma care program. 
um, that's been a long time coming and will really help to um, improve the health of so many uh, low-income Canadians. Uh, I, I, I know that the details right now are, are, are a little vague, especially on the pharmacare, and so I do hope that there are more details that um, we'll see this forward uh, in the next short while. Um, but building on that, uh, I thought Andre Picard had a terrific op-ed in, in the Globe um, that I read this morning that just really helped, you know, talked about how we need to step back and think about, you know, what what is Medicare about and what should be covered in Medicare? And for so long, it's been, you know, focused on physician and hospital services. Um, and so it's great to see the dental care and the home care, but uh, sorry, the dental care and the um, pharma care. But of course, what the pandemic and pre-pandemic reports have highlighted is, you know, we, we need to also bring in long-term care and home care um, better into our system uh, and mental health care. Um, mental health care, uh, you know, there have been some great uh, innovations during the pandemic to su- or great new services, I should say, during the pandemic um, that have allowed people to access that virtually. I think those kinds of things need to be expanded to have greater public access in a structured way. Um, I think uh, some you know work we've done around home um, transitions from hospital to home has uh, really shone a light for me on how patients and caregivers they think the number priority for improving that transition would be better quality and more accessible home care. And then of course I don't think I need to to tell anyone who's listening about why we need to invest better in long term care. So I think we need to um, really take a look at these other sectors, and I'd like to see more of that in the bu- budget upcoming. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, absolutely. And like you say, when we say universal health care, we really need to define what we need, mean by universal. And, and I think that list that you offered is, is much more comprehensive than what our system currently offers Canadians. Now, what would you like to see? Well, I think in addition to what Tara has mentioned, um, I think the one thing I would like to see is uh, an expansion of services that offer you know, both Western medical services and for Indigenous people, you know, Indigenous um, forms of healing, ceremony, cultures, healing. Um, you know, there are models of, of this across the country, but uh, I would like to see funding uh, for the expansion of those services. Thank you. Yeah, so, so needed. And I certainly uh, see that in my work in the Yukon and it's something our communities uh, there are asking for. David, you're a surgeon. What do you want to see in the budget? You know, I'm just most worried about the degree of federal investment in um, in healthcare. Uh, I think it's really important to make sure that it doesn't wane much more because I do worry about the province's uh, ability to be able to uh, provide comprehensive services that uh, address the uh, principles of the uh, Canada Health Act. And with the declining share of provincial expenditures that's covered through the uh, Canada Health Transfer, uh, I think we become at risk uh, without uh, continued and increased uh, federal investment in health care. And I think that's the most important uh, thing I would look for um, uh, from the federal government. Yeah, absolutely. That's critical. We know the dollars have stagnated and they're sent to decline as a percentage cost. So stabilizing investments in our system will be key. Sue, I want you the last word. What matters to you in this federal budget? Oh boy, I'm hardly an economist and a, I've got a degree in Shakespeare. But anyways, let me give you a, a sense from my biased perspective. I have a son with a disability. While dental and pharma care is very important to us, I just paid his um, dental bill a couple of days ago, and that would be great to have help with that for disabled people. But I think what we're really missing is some sort of disability benefit that's universal for folks who are disabled across Canada. So that's not just so piecemeal province to province. BC's benefit uh, amount is extremely low compared to other provinces, considering our cost of living, especially since there's going to be a lot of people with long COVID that are going to be flooding into the system fairly soon and who are unable to work and who need that support as far as a disability benefit. I know it's something our organizations have been lobbying for, but I got to tell you, you know, you talk about equity and inclusion, disability tends to come last. And so I wanted to make sure that I mentioned it. Um, my son certainly doesn't get nearly enough money for him to be able to live on. He gets $400 a month for rent, which in Vancouver area is ridiculous. So there's that. And then my other two things is if I had a magic wand and I'm doing real blue sky thinking, and I know this is not going to show up, in the, but I wish 
nationally, there was some mandate that there had to be engagement with patients, not at just at the hospital level, but at all levels in healthcare, including community healthcare, including public health. I wish this was more of a mandated thing like it is in um, some of the Australian health regions and in the NHS in the UK. And also, I think we're counting the wrong things as far as funding. Really, we count like efficiencies and acuity and length of stay and all that type of thing. And what I wish that we counted were um, feedback mechanisms, like the patient experience and what the experience is like in healthcare. I wish that that was somehow tied to funding because I think that's the only way the patient experience is going to actually improve. So those are the three things, the disability benefit, mandate engagement with patients, and also some sort of mandatory feedback mechanisms for patients. All fantastic ideas. Well, I, we're out of time. Unfortunately, I feel like we could carry on this conversation for a long time. Uh, there's so much knowledge in this group of panelists and, and so much to be done in the healthcare system. But I really want to thank each of, of the four of you for your time tonight and your insights in how to build a stronger, more sustainable and, and patient-centered healthcare system. And to everyone who joined us tonight as a listener, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to join. It's not too late to tweet your thoughts about the session or any ideas you have or things you want to contribute to the conversation about how we should do health differently during COVID and beyond. So please use hashtag CMA Health Summit. We'd love to see your ideas. It helps us uh, think about future events and, and to inform these discussions and questions for our next time. May 11th will be that next CMA Health Summit session, and we are going to be focusing on healthcare and economic prosperity. So for now, good night uh, and thanks for joining. <laughs>